Good morning. Good morning from Australia. What time have we got? Nearly eight o'clock. So I would imagine that most families in Australia right now would be very busy and people in the UK would be getting ready to settle down for the night. Feel free to say hello. Hey, Nancy. Good to see you. What time is it in California? Gorgeous California. It has been such a long time since I have done a live. Good night from Ireland. <laughs> Good night, Susan. Hi, Lila. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Nice to see you. Hi, Mel. Kathleen. Emily. Victoria. Are you joining us this morning? Victoria, Sarah, anybody else who has access to Intune Families. We're doing our first live session at 9.30 this morning. Lunchtime. Wow. Hi, Teresa. Christy. Good name. Good name. All the best people are called Christy. Carla. Emma. Hi. Oh, procrastinating, are we? Procrastination is my middle name. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to connect with everybody. It has been so long since I have been on here live. I've missed you all. Summer! Hi! Yes. 9.30 in Inchun Families. No school run this morning, Christy. No school run for me. Actually, today is my six-year-old daughter's last day of school. She's off to say goodbye to everyone. And then we are, you know, joining the school of life. <laughs> you go and get your monster to bed, Rach. I totally get it. Morning, Ash. How are you, my darling? Good morning, Shaz. Oh, from Melbourne's latest COVID area. Holy dooly. Good morning, Sarah. So, yeah, that's right. All the best people procrastinate, don't we ever? So there's a reason I'm going live this morning, and it's because I would like to talk about autistic communication and culture and how our little people who are autistic develop I don't want to say social skills because I feel like that term has been taken and turned into something that's kind of used against the autistic community hello from New York how wonderful so the first thing I'd like to say is, as autistic people, and look, this we are all completely different. We share commonalities and similar characteristics, but of course, we are all completely different. Now, I happen to be a PDA autistic, which means that I really struggle when anything threatens to compromise my autonomy or my freedom. So, I love a good debate. I love to be able to connect with people who are free thinking and who are not afraid to engage in a difficult conversation around controversial topics. Now, a lot of people... Hi, Pam! Hi! Hi, Fiona! Ah, oh, excellent, Ash. Looking forward to seeing you there. A lot of people are terrified of having a debate or having a conversation with people in case there's disagreements. And I kind of feel like, as a society, we've been somewhat conditioned to steer clear 
of conversations where we might disagree or it might get heated. You know, there's that saying that you should never talk about politics or religion. I love to talk about politics and religion. <laughs> um, I do have a point and I will get there. I know that a lot of children who are autistic are not afraid to delve into the conversations that are juicy. We have as children so many questions about humanity and why people do the things they do. We learn by asking questions, but we know when we're being lied to, and that can be very, very confusing. Now, if your child or if you are a PDA, -er, hi Christine, hi Lauren, you will recognize that children with a PDA profile of autism will not accept BS. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll just, you know, we have this radar for people who are trying to smooth over a situation or who are afraid of confrontation. And as children, we tend to be dismantlers, disruptors, and we like to draw out those impurities because that's what they feel like to us. In a school environment, something that I see often, and not just in a school environment, in any social environment, often the way that autistic children connect with their peers is authentically to begin with. We show up, we share our thoughts and our feelings, and that is very quickly quashed because of that overriding fear of confrontation and the need to be likable. As an autistic person, I don't have a need to be likable. I did though, when I was younger, I was conditioned to mask so that I would be likable and that took priority over my own mental health and well-being. This is dangerous for autistic people, particularly when we're young. At school, educators and with um, our allied health professionals, there is often a focus on making sure that our children develop social skills so that they are likable, so that they don't argue, so that they're agreeable. We don't want this because what this encourages is masking. Now masking is a really complex discussion because when I choose to mask it will be because I want to engage with something to get in to get ahead in life. So it might be a job interview, it might be a university oral presentation or whatever. But then there's masking where we pretend to be someone we're not and then we completely lose ourselves and we have no idea who we are and then our mental health and well-being is chronically impacted. Autistic children are going to have social ramifications for who they are. Society is like the ABA of the world. We do get a lot of feedback from our natural environment, whether we're acceptable or not. But something I see happen a lot is when adults intervene with young autistic relationships and keep autistic children apart from their friends because they niggle at each other all the time. Now, I, I see this a lot in school environments or social environments whether our children are identified autistic or not doesn't matter. They are drawn to one another. So you might have noticed that if you have an autistic child or if you're an autistic person, you may remember from your childhood or even now, like attracts like. We are drawn to other people who have a similar energy to us. So often we might have children who are diagnosed or identified autistic, who have these friends at school who we can recognize are autistic, but they might not have a clue and their parents may not know and that's okay. The point is 
autistic children tend to have autistic friends. What happens there is that because they're similar, they may argue a lot. They may yell and scream at each other. They may decide that they hate each other's guts in one moment and then they come back to one another the next day. Our children might come home and say, oh, little Johnny pushed me over in the playground and I hate him and I'm so mad at him and I'm never going to play with him again. And as parents, we've been conditioned to say and to feel that's not okay. No, this is not okay. You cannot have relationships like that where children are arguing all the time and hating each other and no, we need to encourage you to find other friends. This is so common when we're raising autistic children. I don't necessarily agree that this is the right thing to do. What our children are doing is very normal in autistic culture. They are children. That means they've only been on the planet for however many years old they are. So if they're a five-year-old in prep, if they're a six-year-old in grade one, that's how long they've been on the planet for. Non-neurodivergent children do not start to develop that sense of awareness and how they relate to others until they're at least six years old. And as autistic people, it takes us a few years longer because we're on a different timeline of development. We're not delayed. We have our own timeline of development because we have a completely different neurobiology. That means we have a completely different brain neurotype and the signaling to the rest of our body is different as well. So it's okay to allow our children to be in connection with other children who are like them. It's okay for our children to argue with other children. This is how autistic people, this is how people develop critical thinking skills, tolerance for other people, tolerance for difference, tolerance for people disagreeing with them, this is how we become accepting of others. If we pull our children out of connection with other children just because they argue all the time, then we rob them of the ability to develop really important engagement skills. It's not our job to be protecting our children from adverse experiences all the time. Now I know as a parent of autistic children, it's really difficult to know when to step back and when to intervene. That can be really, really tricky because we feel so protective as parents anyway, but when we know our children are more sensitive, they have um, a more extensive emotional depth and range, they have big feelings and very little capacity to cope with them, <laughs> which I still relate to as an autistic adult. These are really important experiences, really important. We cannot expect our autistic children's peers to be accepting of them if we don't allow our autistic children to develop the skills to be accepting of others. So I think it's really important for us to allow our children to have relationships where they argue. Now I know as an autistic adult, I have this relationship with my husband's brother, my brother-in-law, where we are very, very similar and we love to have a really good debate about things. We often have opposing experiences and beliefs about certain things and when we get together in a family environment we know that other people get a little bit nervous because I think they think that we're arguing with anger behind our discussion but it's passion. Autistic people are passionate. We really believe in the things that 
we're passionate about. So when I sit down with my brother-in-law and we're talking about gender diversity or we're talking about racism or we're talking about autism, we're really passionate. So I say what I think. He disagrees with me. I disagree with him. Our voices do get louder for sure. But for him and I, underneath all of that, we don't feel um, a contempt or an anger toward each other. We are just really, really passionate. We can finish that conversation and we can walk away still feeling 100% okay and loving each other. But everybody around us becomes really nervous. I have this relationship with my oldest daughter as well. You know, we become really passionate when we talk about social issues and other family members become really nervous. And, you know, growing up in the house I grew up in, often adults would step in and say, okay, and try and move what was happening into a different area. We're not going to talk about that anymore. Let's watch this wonderful movie on TV. Or, okay, no, we're not going to debate about uh, animal welfare anymore. Let's watch Mickey Mouse on TV. I want to encourage you as families to not feel that you have to do that. I know that for non-autistic people, in non-autistic culture, for many people, it's really important to be agreeable and likable and to be pleasant and kind. Autistic people can be pleasant and kind as well. We are, but we have a different style of communication. This is what we're talking about when we have the conversation around autistic culture. So it's not that our way of communicating is wrong. It's that we are talking about autistic culture. We have a different way. When you read the writing from autistic advocates and activists online, sometimes people read what we write and think that we're being uh, what's a word that I can use? That we're forcing our opinions onto other people or that we are being hard. And sometimes that's really not the case. It's just that this is our way of communicating. I'm just going to read some of the comments here. Carrie says, sobbing because I have four under seven all neurodivergent and myself and I'm always questioning how much is too much because everything we do is so big yeah but there is learning and growth but it can be alarming to hear and see yes I understand that Lauren says this is so interesting because often I override my true feelings with what I am expected to feel mm and will move in the interests of the expectancy of those around me rather than myself. This is called masking. Everyone is live tonight. Are they? <laughs> yeah. Lauren, I relate. <laughs> I relate. This is what we're taught to do. And sometimes it's inadvertently as well. Society you know, society kind of grooms us for being <sighs> compliant with gender stereotypes. So, you know, those stereotypes around how we should behave, how we should speak, what our voice should sound like. Hi, Katie. Ah, oh, back at you, girl. I was thinking of a word you could use. It begins with C and a lot of people don't like hearing it. <laughs> it's one of my favourite words, actually. I will often mask on my own like I'm being watched. Yeah. And this is how deep it runs. 
when autistic people, when our children, I mean, when you look at some of the, the ways that those social skills programs are formulated, they actually pick apart every single part of our being, how we dress, do we, do we dress appropriately, our facial expressions, the way we present ourselves, the tone of our voice, whether we talk about our passions, our special interests too much. Are we listening to the other person? Are we asking them questions about their interests? A lot of those programs encourage autistic people to put ourselves second to everybody around us. Imagine, imagine the impact that has on a child. We're teaching them in their formative years to follow. Autistic children are always taught to follow. And it's not a good beginning. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't guide our children in their connections with others. But we do it in alignment with the understanding of autistic culture that our way is different. It's not wrong. It's different. And that our children are children. It's okay for them to have social ramifications. It's okay for our children to have arguments. It's not okay for them to be bullied. That's something different. But it's okay for our children to argue with other children. It doesn't mean that they shouldn't have those friends. It means that they're working out how to stand on their own two feet. They're working out how to advocate for themselves. This is very useful. I got called angry today in a debate when I was just passionate. Yes. See, now, the first thing I think when somebody says that I'm being angry or abusive or whatever word somebody might use is that they're feeling insecure. It's almost a form of gaslighting in a way. Absolutely, Christine, children, not patients. Just because we have the word autism attached to a human being does not mean that, that it's an instant qualifier for a plethora of therapies. We tune into the individual needs of the child, but it shouldn't end in childhood. You know, we're human beings. We tune into the support needs of autistic people across the lifespan because our supports fluctuate in any given moment. Yeah, it is, Christine. That's a, that's a better expression for it, tone policing. Oh, yeah. Anyway, I just wanted to drop in and say this because I see it a lot. I see autistic children kept apart from one another. <sighs> Something that we heard often, oh, Sarah... You and I both, I'm too intense, too sensitive, too loud, too outspoken, too many opinions. Oh, Jenny, that's lovely. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Something we heard as parents, my husband and I heard as parents a lot um, 10 years ago was avoid, avoid immersing your autistic child in environments where there are other autistic children because they'll learn more habits from autistic children. <sighs> what that means is don't put them with other autistic children because they'll stim more and they might look more autistic. And the, the other advice was to immerse autistic children with non-autistic children so that they can learn social skills. <sighs> I cannot say this enough. Our autistic children need to be immersed with other autistic children because that is autistic culture and identity. They, you know, when our children are in an environment where they are only immersed with non-autistic children, it highlights their difference only in a negative way. It others them. When you're in an environment and you are not the same as everybody else, it is hard to develop positive autistic identity. If you have access 
to your autistic neurokin, then you feel normal. Then you have positive identity. So finding children who are autistic like our children, or for us as adults, finding other autistic people is when we feel normal. When we learn about our identity and our culture, what's okay for us. If we're in an environment where we're with people who are not the same as us, then we only see ourselves as bad and wrong and needing fixing and changing. This is called ableism. When professionals encourage parents to have goals that work toward normalization rather than actualization, this is called ableism. It is discrimination. Yeah. I was undiagnosed as a child, just dubbed gifted, but I found taking a seminar on schoolyard conflict resolution skills and later studying interpersonal communication itself were ultimately the best social skills training because it helped me understand the concept on a meta level and adapt better to inter-neurotype communication and most of the friends I made were also neurodivergent. Yeah. So Mel, I, I read that and I identify instantly that you are my neurokin. Just by the language you use, we know our people. Yeah, that's important too, Annie. You know, we don't, we don't always have to find autistic groups for our kids. We look at their interests and often when we seek out clubs and groups based on their interests there will be other autistic kids there anyway like Lego groups and you know computer groups or whatever. They'll find their people through their interests as well so we don't have to go to an OT and say oh gosh can you tell me about all of the current social groups for autistic children because I mean the likelihood of those groups being targeted around targeted toward autistic children and based on neuronormative social skills is very likely. We can find our children's people organically It's so interesting learning about this. When I read my son's NDIS goals, I read they had written that we as parents would like our son to stop covering his ears and handle loud noises. I never ever said this and I feel sick with the language. I don't want to change him. I just want to support him to manage the noise and his environment. And we can change the wording of those goals and we can speak to them about that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You can request that this be changed. Yeah, I had a I had a similar experience. <laughs> I'm I'm laughing because it was so ridiculous, but anyway, I am off for the day, off to run a family session for ITF. It's lovely to be here everybody. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night, day, evening, morning, life, all of it. Mwah. Bye bye.